Good afternoon and happy Thursday, everybody. Congratulations. You've almost made it to the weekend. Uh, depending on where you are, you've, it's either been hot, hotter, or hottest. I hope you're all surviving and able to spend some time in a swimming pool. We're going to get back to discovery. This is, I believe, our third session of discovery, and we're going to be doing a fourth session in a few months. Uh, Tammy will identify the date and time of that when we, uh, when we wrap this one up. Uh, let's, well, let's go to Dr. Depot fees. And we've got, we, we should all know we've got a schedule for that. PTPs, QMEs are 250 bucks an hour for the med, med legal testimony. And med legal is important there because it's not med legal testimony. As we'll find out in short order, um, they may not be entitled that $250 an hour. AMEs are going to cost us some more. $250 times that modifier of $1.25 or $312.50 with a minimum of one hour. So ask one question. And I've actually had a deposition that lasted no longer than 10 minutes. We're still paying the $312.50. That's uh, one of the many reasons that I'm not a big fan of AMEs. They cost more. They do a lot. Uh, they do a worse job in terms of applying the AMA guides. There's a whole host of reasons that I strongly recommend against using AMEs um, and instead relying on a PTP report, MMI report, and/or a QME. Um, if you're if you haven't heard me go off on that, um, go off on my uh, little soapbox about reasons we should avoid AMEs, please feel free to send me an email and I'll be happy to provide the details of that. Plus reasonable time, reasonable time, particularly prep time. It's interesting that virtually every doctor, in fact, every doctor I've seen in the last 10 years has provided, has told us that they've prepped for one hour, regardless of whether there's a couple of reports to review or, or, or uh, um, half a dozen. I find that very interesting and suspect, but it's probably something we don't want to argue too terribly hard when we're trying to get the doctor to see things our way. Additionally, they're entitled to reasonable travel, but uh, the price of reasonable travel, um, but luckily we're able to avoid that in most cases because the attorneys travel to the doctor. Show me the money. When? When do we need to pay these doctors? Well, first off, when we're dealing with an AME or a doctor appointed by the WCAB, um, formerly known as an IME or independent medical examiner, now that phraseology has been changed um, by the labor code. It's now a regular doctor. So whether you've got a regular doctor appointed by the WCAB or an AME, we need to pay in advance um, the estimated time, probably an hour um, for deposition, and the estimated prep time, probably an hour for two hours. If we don't pay in advance, they may act as a waiver, and we may not be allowed to even proceed with that deposition, definitely hamstringing our um, efforts come trial time. Now, again, these are this, uh, this last rule I read applies only to doctors appointed by the WCAB or agreed to by the parties, AMEs, only. And there's a case, there's a case that goes way back that prepayment is not required um, for a defense QME, only AMEs. Um, uh, IMEs or uh, regular doctors. When is the prepayment best paid? Well, with the subpoena and uh, at least 10 days, um, at least 10 days prior to the deposition itself. Um, of course, I haven't seen too many times that doctors' depositions have been set within 10 days um, or have gone forward within 10 days of the notice. Doctor schedules tend to be a little tight. The attorneys' not schedules tend to be a little tighter than that. And um, one great way of really ticking off the doctor and having him or her come in um, dead set against you is to force their hand and make them show up in within 10 days. The court may shorten or extend the time for scheduling a deposition or may stay its taking until the determination of a motion for protective order. Um, shortening the time timeline of 10 days, I've actually never seen that happen. Um, staying the time until the determination of a motion for protection order. Um, more typically, you get down to the um, to the deposition, whether it be of a doctor um, and or an, an applicant and or a witness, recipient witness, and somebody doesn't like the way things are going. The applicant's counsel says we're unduly harassing uh, his or her client, for example. At that point, more typically, they'll ask to... Um, um, stop the deposition and file for a protective order. But it's possible to do it even before the deposition takes place. So show me the prepayment money. How much should we be paying for these things? Well, typically, as I suggested earlier, one hour prep time, 
one hour testimony, two hours. But I rarely find that everything is able, that I'm able to complete everything in one hour. Um, my depositions of doctors tend to go long because I've been taking, taking a doctor's deposition. The case has probably some fairly significant value. And I will prepare many hours for these doctor depositions. Typically, a doctor deposition, I prepare more for a doctor's deposition than I do for trial. Um, because by trial time, much, mu much of the uh, um, evidence is in cement. Whereas when we're dealing with the doctor's deposition, uh, things are things are um, malleable, and we're maybe in a position to move things in our direction more favorable to us a little more than come trial time. So, given that fact, I strongly recommend that we bring that somebody be bringing a, a checkbook so that when we go over the one hour and the doctor says, "Okay, your time is up," we can offer to pay then and there and continue the deposition. If there is a deposition um, fee dispute. What happens? This can cause problems, but there are answers. Uh, and there was a case a while back, the PTP um, was not cross-examined because of the fee dispute. Then the question was, should that, that report be excluded? Because there was, well, the argument was there was not an opportunity. There was not, uh, uh, the, the right to cross-examination had, uh, had been defeated. The answer was, no, that report is not gonna be excluded. And the reason was, they said that this was the defense's problem. The employee was not involved in this dispute and to exclude a report because the defense couldn't get along with the PTP as far as the PTPs were considered, that would penalize the applicant. So here are the pointers. If you have a fee dispute, one, the doctor should accept what the sum that's offered and file a lien. Don't expect that to happen um, because the doctor has a way around that and I would never rely on it. I would always do number two, and that is pay the requested fee and reserve a right for credit. I've done this many a times, and it's, it's a very simple process and not time consuming, not costly. And it also provides an opportunity for us not to not tick off the doctor um, before the deposition takes place. How should we prepare to take a doctor's deposition? I just said that we spent, I spent many uh often often many hours preparing for a doctor's deposition one of the things i always do is subpoena the doctor's entire file um and i find i'm surprised that a number of attorneys don't do that in fact i, I don't even know if if, uh, if it's a majority of attorneys who do so uh, for a whole host of reasons some of which we're going to go through today um, one of the primary ones is the most obvious ones is, um, imagine this, you're, I've, I've spent hours preparing for a deposition, I've got all my questions lined up, um, I know how I'm gonna respond, if the doctor says X, Y, or Z, then I'm going to answer or ask one, two, or three. It's a, it's sort of a calculus. I've got this calculus all set up based upon all the available reports, show up at the deposition, and the doctor says, oh, I have these three additional reports you need to take a look at. Oh, lovely. I've got five minutes to read the reports and somehow incorporate them into my line of um, line of thinking and my line of questioning. So behind the eight, bill, uh, eight ball, and it's all my fault. So subpoena the entire file, and we avoid that surprise. Why else do we want to? Um, why do we want to subpoena the file? Well, we want to make sure that we have every pain chart. Um, I'm sure you've all seen doctors' reports, medical legals, in which are pain charts, usually black and white, very much very similar to these, where the applicant is supposed to show with dots or X's or lines or coloring in where the tingling is, where the sharp pain is, where with the direction it radiates, etc. And as often as not, you'll see, or I've seen anyway, applicants draw a color through the entire arm and entire leg saying that's where it hurts. It's hard. It, it hurts my entire limb or limbs, which is just silly because medically that's not how it works. And as you can see from here, a nerve will innervate only one specific area or trail. It doesn't do the entire, the, the entire limb. So if they're drawing, if they're drawing too much on the, on the uh, figure, uh, we know that they're, uh, their information is a bunch of malarkey. And we need to use that to cross-examine the doctor, determine whether or not the doctor has relied on you know, false medical information. Why else do we want to do this? Well, we want to um, uh, review every ADL that the doctor has discussed with the applicant. Now remember, 
What are ADLs? ADLs are an estimate of the impact on activities of daily living is what we're dealing with. And that's really the definition of whole person impairment. Um, if the doctor is trying to increase or decrease the, uh, the WPI or impairment, um, we have to figure out why. What type of ADLs is the doctor claiming are, are being impacted or what kind of ADLs are they um, representing the applicant has claimed uh, are being um, impacted and to what extent. Why else do we want to subpoena the entire file? Well, we want every test um, score and this, not just the test score, which you'll find in um, the report undoubtedly itself, but the tests themselves, the MMPI report, or rather testing information, for example, or the Epworth test. Remember, this is a sleepiness scale. I have seen at least one doctor change the scores on an Epworth sleepiness scale. The applicant had uh, circled these various numbers, and I saw them scratched out in new numbers for re um, in different handwriting on the right-hand side of the page. I asked, doctor, what is this? He said, oh, well, I explained the uh, test to the applicant. We got new answers. Well, if you review the, uh, um, the method, the appropriate method for utilizing the Epworth sleepiness scale, you'll learn that's exactly the best way to make the Epworth um, test ineffective. It, uh, it nullifies it. it. It will not work. It's, it's totally inappropriate. Why else do we want to subpoena the entire file? Well, for a whole host of reasons, and they just keep on going on. Let me tell you a fun little war story or workers' compensation story. Uh, many years ago in Santa Rosa, when I subpoenaed a doctor's file in preparation for taking the doctor's deposition. We swore the doctor in and I asked him to review a number of reports that I'd subpoenaed, uh, that I'd gotten from his file after subpoenaing it. And the doctor took a look at the file or looked at the reports and got an ashen look on his face and said, where did you get these reports? Where did you get this information? Now, normally I don't answer the questions. I ask the questions at a deposition, but I noticed that the court reporter was writing it down, so I decided to play the game. I, um, it turns out by the, that these reports and these records demonstrated that the doctor was treating the applicant, which is fine. That's exactly what he was supposed to be doing. The, the doctor was billing my client, which too was entirely appropriate. But three, the doctor was then turning around and billing the federal government for the same, same services. This is called fraud. It is considered naughty, at least that's what they taught me at law school. Um, and so, as I said, the doctor said, where did you get those reports? Where did you get those records? To which I said, and I quote, they were in your file. To which he said, and I quote, those weren't supposed to be in there. Trust me, doctor, I believe, even if you weren't sworn in, I believe that's true. Um, so these are the, I would never have gotten those records had I not subpoenaed the doctor's file. We also want to be able to determine our objectives. Um, um, and uh, if, uh, if we're, why, why would we take a doctor's deposition if all we want to do is clarify um, some unclear areas in the doctor's report? And we see mathematical errors, for example. Doctor, you know, doctor, uh, 35 plus 35, you said it was 95. Isn't it 70? It was 70 last time I checked. Um, a supplemental report can take care of that and you know, such simple things. So let, we have to determine our objective. But normally, at least, actually exclusively when I take a doctor's deposition, is to undercut the, do undercut the doctor's report, to render it non-substantial or insubstantial evidence so the judge cannot rely on it. I, if I'm taking a doctor's deposition, you can rest assured that I am not happy with what the doctor has just done to my client and we're going to attack him. Um, and it's a lot of fun. We've got to attack every inconsistency, every illogical step, every refusal to follow the rules of California workers' compensation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Medical reports predicated upon an incorrect legal theory do not constitute substantial evidence. So if the doctor is applying an incorrect medical theory, and I can think of one that I see all the time, the report is not substantial evidence and the judge cannot rely upon it. Similarly, if it's inconsistent, it conflicts with the applicant's testimony, the um, uh, testing that's performed is somehow problematic. All of these can render the report not substantial evidence and therefore the judge can't rely on it. Um, a typical or uh, a situation I see often in which the doctor utilizes an incorrect medical theory is the uh, when they're facing apportionment and oftentimes they'll cite Escobedo, a case that came down in April 19th of 2005 
exactly one year after SB 899. That was the apportionment um, that, uh, apportionment en banc decision. And the doctor will say, per Escobedo, because this applicant was um, symptom-free prior to the industrial injury, there is no apportionment. Well, that's exactly what Escobedo didn't say. It said just the opposite. Based on that verbiage alone, I've managed to get reports uh, uh, out, of, out of the record. We talked about the doctor's claims being internally consistent or inconsistent, whether they're consistent with the applicant's claims. And we want to compare the applicant's deposition testimony with what the doctor reports both in his or her formal report, as well as what he or she writes down in their, in their notes from the examination. Can we slip, slip, stipulate to the doctor's expertise? Um, this is typically pro forma. Everybody says, yeah, this doctor is just wonderful and we're going to stipulate to them. Um, I think that's a huge mistake. Remember earlier I said the primary, almost exclusive reason I take a doctor's deposition is to attack them, to find that their report is not substantial evidence, to demonstrate that they've just not good a judge, done a good job. So I'm going to start the deposition by saying this person is wonderful, they're an expert, they rock and roll, um, just darn silly. And yet I'll bet you the next thing, time you see a doctor's deposition transcript, if you take a look at it, um, the parties will have stipulated to the doctor's expertise because they just want to be polite, um, even though one or both of, well, probably one of the lawyers is trying to undercut the doctor's report. Just silliness that I think a lot of people haven't bothered to think through. So the doctor wants to Elmerez Guzman you, which doesn't sound like a good thing, and it isn't 99% of the time. By the way, footnote, there are cases, um, um, trial level, and I still have one panel case in which the uh, Dr. Elmeraz Guzman, or more appropriately, Guzman, the applicant, and lowered his whole person impairment, provided a WPI that was lower than you would normally get if you applied um, the uh, AME guides in a strict manner. So it, it can uh, work to your advantage. But if the eye doctor wants to Guzman you, you have to challenge his expertise. And the evidence code provides that if they don't have a special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education sufficient to make them an expert, they're not testifying as an expert. They're testifying as a precipient witness, which means they're not really in a position to provide you with a med legal. We'll talk a little bit more about the difference between an expert witness and a precipient witness in a few minutes. Um, so one more reason not to stipulate to their expertise. By the way, um, one obvious suggestion that the doctor doesn't know what they're doing is when they call it an Elmerez Guzman decision. That's so old school. That's bef before this thing went up to the Sixth District Court of Appeal. At this point, it's a Guzman. Elmerez is completely irrelevant on that score. What is the tr we want to explore what is the extent of the doctor's AMA guides training, their Guzman training, not Elmerez Guzman. How many medical legal reports have they written? How many have involved Guzman? And um, et cetera. Why didn't the doctor use the traditional parts of the guides? This is actually from the District, Sixth District Court of Appeal. Um, it's, oh Lord, it's somewhere between half a dozen and a dozen years ago now, but it's still good law. Given the comprehensiveness of the precision attendant to the chapters pertaining to each system, in most cases, a judge will credit ratings based strictly on the chapter devoted to the body, part, region, or system affected. In short, you got a spine case, you stay in chapter 15, the spine chapter. You don't go to the hernia chapter in most cases. So the point is the doctor is actually facing an uphill battle, and I think we sometimes forget to put their feet to the fire and um, prove that, but an uphill, uphill, uphill battle in providing an alternative Guzman analysis. Best deposition ever, the one that's canceled because it's unnecessary and never occurs. You want to improve your chances of getting what you want without a deposition, or in other words, have a medical miracle. Um, here's something I like to do. Oftentimes, we'll get a number of reports month after month from the PTP, and they'll say pretty much the same thing and end with TTD, TTD, TTD. Um, when the applicant's condition doesn't change and is not likely to change in any significant way with or without treatment in the next year, that's the definition of MMI. 
And so when the doctor provides report after report that does pretty much the same thing other than a change in date and in, in, in the case TTD, uh, that's somewhat suspect. So what I'll typically do is send a letter to the doctor and say, it appears that you found the applicant, uh, applicant's condition is stabilized. Um, are, they, are they PNS or MMI? And most typically the answer is a complete uh, rejection, not rejection, I don't even get that, a complete um, um, non-answer, no response whatsoever. And I just get another report that says TTD um, with uh, no indication of any changes or no, um, nothing listed. So at that point, I'll take that report, the former letter, and send a new letter and say, Doctor, I think you must have uh, missed my uh, prior, uh, prior letter. Um, here is uh, here's the former letter. Here are your three reports when you found the condition hasn't changed. And here's notice of your deposition. Now, doctors don't like having their, take, having, taking their, dep having their deposition taken. I know it seems like a, a good thing because they, they get paid fairly well, but that's by our standards, I think. By doctor standards, that's a miser, miserly sum. I think they can do far better when they're uh, examining 27 patients in, in one hour, right? I joke, but you understand where I'm going with that. Um, they can make more money. It's a money losing proposition for them to spend their time at the deposition. Moreover, when our deposition schedule, well, usually early in the morning or um, in the evening after after they've completed their practice. So it's it's um, uh, inconvenient for them. Um, God forbid that they miss their golf their golf game. Um, thirdly. What's what's going to happen at the position? Some scumbag like me is going to attack them, attack their credibility, try to make them look stupid. That's nothing that anybody in the right mind wants to go through. So for those three reasons, doctors I don't think tend to like to have their deposition taken. So in response to this notice of the deposition, more often than not, and in fact I'd say over 80% of the time, I've received MMI reports or PNS reports if you want to go old school. Depositions of doctors. Um, why don't we have doctor deposit? or strike that. Why don't we cross-examine doctors down at the WCAB? Um, in my 25 years of doing this, I've actually never seen that happen. I've seen doctors that testify as recipient witnesses. Again, we'll talk about that later, um, but not as experts. And the reason is they really, the WCAB and the labor code really want us just to take their deposition. Um, we've got a couple codes on point, the CCR, the WCIB favors cross-examination of medical witnesses by way of a deposition. Saves a lot of time and money. So if you've got a PTP MMI or a QME or an AME, it, it's calendared. Uh, the, PMI, the PNS or MMI report is calendared. When do you schedule the doctor's deposition? I think typically people wait for the doctor's report, um, MMI report to come out, review it, and then decide whether to take their deposition. So we sit there with our fingers crossed, hoping that we won't have to take the deposition. Um, and then when the report come, comes sideways, we set the deposition and typically it takes a couple, few months. Yes, we have 10 days, but typically because with everybody's playing nice, it takes two or three months to schedule the deposition. Wonderful, um, he said sarcastically. What I like to do is um, at the time we set the doctor's um, uh, scheduled the MMI examination. I also like to set the doctor's deposition for thirty uh, for six, you know, thirty to sixty days thereafter. Um, just notice it. Um, why do I do that? I want the doctor to know that we are prepared to take his or her deposition if they go sideways in their report. Um, one is sort of a shot of the cannonball over their bow, and two, it saves a lot of time. Let's say the doctor nevertheless goes sideways on us, and we're not happy with the report. Now, we, we haven't had to wait for the, the uh, examination to take place and wait for the, us to receive the report and wait for us to have the opportunity to review the report and have an opportunity for us to talk, get together and decide whether we're going to take the doctor's deposition. All that's taken care of, and now we can straight to the, go straight to the deposition, taking the doctor's deposition. So we, we save a lot of time in the process. You might say, well, how much does it cost? Aren't we going to incur the cost of setting the deposition? No, that's pennies, pennies that we'll save um, in very short order. What about deposing do uh, utilization review doctors? Do we pose them or do we put them, uh, do we cross-examine them at trial? And the answer is no, no, and no. There is, according to the Aguilar decision, which has been around for over a decade now, there's no legal basis 
um, for a supplemental report by a utilization review doctor, and that includes no basis for um, a deposition. Your only answer is an IMR. Um, sometimes that works to our disadvantage, but for the most part, I think we, we on the defense side like utilization review than IMR. It certainly led to a dramatic savings in, in treatment, so uh, we, uh, we, we are not unhappy with this Aguilar decision. The doctor's deposition fee, I talked about uh, expert fees and precipient witness fees. If they're an expert, well, we go back to the labor code we discussed um, with the 250 or the uh, modifier for the AME. If they're a mere precipient witness, they do not get an expert opinion fee. Um, if they're not an expert, uh, if there's no expert opinion provided, they are treated like you and I are treated. Let's say you witness a car accident and one of the parties subpoenas you to act as a witness. You are not going to be paid $250 or $350 an hour. You're going to be given a, uh, a base fee. I don't know what it is now, maybe $15 or $35. I haven't, I haven't looked into that lately. It's not um, part of my bailiwick. But nevertheless, it's a, a, a miserly sum, let's put it that way. Um, that's all the doctor is going to get if we only, if we don't ask expert opinion for his expert opinion opinion so if the doctor for example witnessed that car accident um, he or she would only get the um, precipient witness fee similarly let's say we're looking for a fraud case at a fraud case if we simply if we're only in, if we're not interested in the doctor's opinion we're only interested in what the applicant said to the doctor so we can determine whether the applicant lied to the doctor then too the doctor is a precipient witness and they do not give, get the big money. They only, oh, there it is. The only $35 daily fee. Now, this presentation is not brand new, um, so that may be more. Your, your results may vary. But if even one medical opinion is asked, and in any of these situations, we now have a, a medical expert and they get the entire fee for the entire deposition, not just for the time of that one or two um, um, medical legal questions, but for the entire deposition. Depositions at the WCAB and not at the court reporters or applicants attorneys or defense attorney's office. Does that happen at the uh, WCAB district office? Yeah, it, it can in rare circumstances. And it's a wonderful way to tick off your judge. So it's not something, not a tool you want to use readily, but keep it in your back pocket as a, um, as a as a tool that can be used when necessary. For example, if there's a dispute regarding privilege at the deposition, what do we do? Well, first off, the judge is going to say, "Okay, go back and try to behave," and I hereby instruct you to behave. But if uh, one or more of the parties can't behave, um, a deposition can be filed, or strike that a motion can be set to file the deposition or set the deposition before the judge. And we've got case law directly on point there. What if there's a discovery dispute? They want to compel an answer because the applicant refuses to answer, or um, applicant thinks that he or she is being abused uh, in some way and unwarranted oppression. Um, an applicant's counsel wants to get a, dis a protective order. Well, similarly, we go to the judge, and the, ju uh, the judge at the, w at the district office can compel the applicant to attend or participate in the deposition. In fact, I think we've all seen situations where the applicant refuses to attend and do we file the petitions to um, um, suspend or bar, bar benefits. Um, we can also, the WCAB can also compel unre unrepresented applicants to attend or participate in deposition as well as to peer, peer procure identification or answer um, certain but not all questions. Not every answer can be compelled. You know, you might say, well, okay, fine, only questions reasonably calculated um, to um, produce uh, um, related or reasonable information. Um, not, not necessarily even there. Whoops, there we go. For example, when the applicant is claiming the fifth, a privilege against self-incrimination, we actually have a case that came down recently on that score. The uh, employer asked questions about the applicant's social security number. No great surprise, the applicant didn't want to answer questions about his social security number. In fact, the applicant said, if I answer questions about the social security number, 
I could get myself in trouble. Now, that's the obvious read of the objection, but that's not the legal read. The legal read is the applicant is simply claiming claim the fifth. It doesn't mean that they would necessarily get in trouble. They're just claiming the fifth. But nevertheless, the judge said, okay, I know what's going on here. You, you're claiming the fifth because you don't want to answer questions about the social security number because you know that would get you in trouble. So, okay, I'm going to uh, at least use that evidence in, against you. And this was brought up to WCAB, and the question was then, what are the consequences of claiming the Fifth Amendment? Uh, and they said, no, 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 the judge was wrong. There is no negative inference to the Fifth. You just basically ignore it and proceed with the other, other available evidence. They said, first off, disclosure of the applicant's Social Security number is voluntary under the Code of Civil, uh, under the CCR, rather. The Social Security numbers are used solely for identification and verification purposes in order to administer the workers' compensation system. Now, that was the argument the WCAB used in part. Um, I kind of read that the other way. If, 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 the C if the Social Security number is used for verification forces purposes to administer, administer the workers' compensation system, isn't that exactly what we're trying to do in the deposition? The WCAB didn't see that that way. They also noted, quote, Social security numbers will not be disclosed, made available, or otherwise used for a purpose other than those specified, except with the consent of the applicant, um, unless uh, or as permitted or required by statute, regulation, or judicial order. Uh, again, I don't understand this argument from the WCAB because it sort of um, make it, well, it makes no sense. They're saying we won't give an order to compel the answer because you can't have it unless there's an order. That's pretty much literally what they say, um, or, or figuratively, I guess, would be the better way of approaching that. Um, so I, I don't, I don't understand this case, but I suspect you're going to find judges are going to follow the illogic to it. Now, this is if you, you're not happy with this case, um, or you've not been happy with it thus far, as unhappy as I am, get ready for this one. They also said. Working under a different social, social security number did not reflect on the applicant's credibility. Really? And did not reflect on the legitimacy of the claim. Really? They're lying? They have a different social security number? It's illegal? They commit crimes? Um, and that's not relevant? It doesn't impact their credibility? Okay, I'm incredulous about that decision. Um, so there is a petition to compel, there is a petition for a, um, a uh, protective order. The WCJ can get into the weeds and provide specific guidelines for the deposition, um, can order, for example, un order a, an avoidance of undue um, interruption. Um, these are all from cases that have come down. Order opposing party to shut up and stop making questions until the cross-examination is complete. Um, issue an order quashing a notice deposition. Um, example of a notice to uh, uh, an order quashing a notice deposition. Uh, there's um, due to unwarranted um, har harassment of the witness. We went over one um, either last session or the session before that, in which there was a claim of um, sexual harassment. Um, uh, a claim of, by, by the applicant, and they claim that their manager was um, committing the harassment. And then the defense at deposition had the manager show up, saying we have a right to have a uh, employer or defense representative at the deposition. And the response to that was, yes, you are entitled to have an employer rep at the deposition, but this is causing unwarranted oppression um, and harassment of the applicant and um, that is inappropriate, a protective order will issue. And then they did a little balancing test. They said, we can get both um, um, objectives here. We can keep the harassing or allegedly harassing manager out of the deposition and thereby protect the applicant. We can also have another employer representative there, thereby protecting the employer's uh, due process. But the judge can't hamstring um, the, the parties um, and provide too much detail in terms of what he or she will allow them to do at a deposition that the judge is not attending. For example, 
There was this case in which there was a site claim and there was non-industrial domestic abuse. Of course, um, the defense wanted to explore the non-industrial non domestic abuse for purposes of uh, substantiality of the claim, um, apportionment, PD, et cetera. Um, the employee said, well, that's unnecessary. Not really. And would cause prolonged emotional trauma. And I, I imagine that's, that's quite possible. So the question was, could the judge limit the employer to 50 questions? And the answer was absolutely positively not. Why? Because psych was completely relevant here. Uh, or rather, strike that. The psyche of the applicant resulting from the domestic abuse was entirely relevant to causation and to apportionment. Um, psych cases are always the more, uh, more interesting of cases. I always find them fascinating. Uh, your standard um, issue orthopedic injury, the low back, L5-S1, we've seen the millions, million of them, and our depositions are, with the exception of um, other employment and other sources of the injury contributing causes, are pretty much pro forma. Uh, but psych, psych uh, becomes more fascinating because we're asking, we need to find out any information or entitled to any information that's relevant to the claim. And what is relevant to one's psyche? Well, Freud said there your potty training is relevant to your psyche. That, so that leaves, leaves a wide, wide range of information that can be, uh, um, that can be explored. If anybody's interested in the most interesting site question I ever got to ask, feel free to email me and I'll tell it to you. Don't forget the CCP, both before, during, and after the deposition, the party may move for a protective order. And this is for unwarranted annoyance, embarrassment, or pressure, oppression, oppression, or undue burden and expense. Must you, the adjuster, agree to deposition? Remember this, unwarranted annoyance, embarrassment, oppression, uh, oppression or undue burden and expense. Um, I, I never met an adjuster who was happy when they got a notice of a deposition. We've always tried to figure out, is there a way to get out of it? Well, let's find out. What does the case law say? In this case, the defense refused to permit the, the adjuster to be deposed after the MSD, and the judge ordered the adjuster to appear at the hearing. A removal was granted to the defense. The judge, it said that the judge has the party, has power to order appearance, but this not, should not be the general rule. This is a case that you want to keep in your little toolbox um, henceforth, because this is the one you're going to cite. Um, uh, Any time somebody tries to subpoena you to a deposition or to a hearing. Um, by the way, it's uh, it's not necessarily citable. Well, it's a panel decision, which means it's not precedent. That is, the judge does not have to follow it, but it is citable, which means you can make reference to it and explain what it says and why the judge should follow the logic of this case. Anyway, back to the case. Uh, removal is granted. The judge was said has the power to order an appearance. Of course they do, but it should not be a general rule, for a, particularly for um, a case involving a penalty issue. Why? Well, because it keeps the adjuster from other files. You've got plenty of work back at the, uh, at the office, and if you don't work the other files, who suffers? Well, you suffer. Um, your employer suffers, um, but the one that we really want to point out, uh, the judge to point out to the judges, it's to the detriment of the other other injured workers who are in your case law. On the other hand, we do have case law going the other way. In this case, there was also a petition for penalties, and there was a petition to compel the deposition of two different adjusters. Um, the defense filed a motion to quash, and it was not granted. They said, well, the employee is entitled to discovery, and the fact that it's inconvenience doesn't do the trick. The fact that the defense has to incur the cost of uh, attorney's fees doesn't cause, cause do the trick. These are not considered substantial prejudice or irreparable harm. Um, I think the rules in these two conflicting cases arose just because uh, one was the defense of one was handled better than the other. But nevertheless, as you know, panel can panel decisions um, can um, can conflict. There's nothing wrong with that legally. So you're very often going to have you know, conflicting decisions on um, similar issues. So do you need an order to compel? 
you can do a walkthrough on that one. You file your petition, you provide all the supporting documents, you provide them directly to the judge at a time and day of the walkthrough, at an appearance, and at an appearance you file a proof of service. Um, you, you have to also provide the judge your proof of service on the applicant, the applicant's counsel, and any and all defendants. Now, um, why, why are you able to do this this simply? Because there's going to be, um, there's going to be a, uh, the opportunity or a strike that a self-destruct um, portion of the, the order. The judge in the order is going to say, if there is an objection to this uh, within 10 days, the order self-destructs and the order to compel is no longer in force. At that point, you're going to have to go down, the parties are going to have to go down in front of the judge and argue it out. What if you want another bite at the apple? And typically, oftentimes, depositions are not completed the first go around, um, particularly in psych depositions or independent contractor depositions or um, uh, um, cases that are heavily fact dependent or those that are um, very, uh, have a great deal of money at stake. So typically, you're unable to complete them, and the parties will just simply stipulate to have the deposition completed at a later, later time. That's very much pro forma. But if the deposition is quote unquote concluded, um, no one who would serve notice of the deposition may take a subsequent deposition. So this, the, the, the uh, verbiage is uh, kind of a big deal. The only, if you've concluded the deposition, if you've not stipulated the completion of the deposition, um, the only option is to be charming and pretty please and get consent or get a court order. Um, Getting a court order requires that you show good cause that you might that you should be given another bite at the de bite at the apple, despite the fact that you failed to get a stipulation to um, complete uh, the deposition when you were at the original deposition. So, what's good cause? It's all going to depend. Yes, no, maybe. Aren't you? Don't you really love that kind of answer? It's such a lawyerly response. Um, in this particular case, we had three different employers. Injury, AOE, COE, another one occurred after the original deposition. Well, the question is going to be, could you have asked questions about this uh, particular injury at the original deposition? In, the, um, in other words, could you see the future? And uh, most typically, the answer is absolutely not. Um, so that was, it was held to, um, that there was good cause to oppose regarding employment and injury subsequent to the first deposition, obviously, because they're going to be relevant to PD and apportionment and a whole host of different factors. Um, similarly, similarly, in this case, the applicant claimed additional body parts at the deposition. Again, the question is, could you have asked questions or about those body parts um, at the original deposition? Not only did you not know, you would have pro pro prohibited from asking questions about unrelated body parts at the original deposition. Applicants' counsel would rightfully object as irrelevant. Um, so for the applicant to provide or uh, claim additional body parts after the deposition is just a little too tricky and it, it won't count. Um, the defense will give the opportunity or will be we ruled to have good cause to proceed with another deposition. So the rule of thumb here, Good cause will be found where the employer would not have had the opportunity to question the applicant about the issue or the issues in the first deposition. On the other hand, there are situations where things will not go so swimmingly for us. For example, um, there have been cases where the deposition proceeded and then there was surveillance that was obtained. And the question was, is it a good cause now to take the applicant's deposition? It's still held no. Um, and I've, by the way, I've gotten this decision go both ways. Um, but uh, it was held no, there's no substantial prejudice or irreparable harm. And I think what the judge was trying to say was there are other options. Send it to the doctor. Doctor, does this reflect? It doesn't, it doesn't, is it, isn't this different from what the applicant told you he or she could do? Or at trial time, let the applicant testify um, um, as to what they can do and then provide the, the film showing otherwise. Obviously, typically they'll have seen the film prior to trial time and will be amending um, their testimony but they, uh, at trial time, but you'll still have the deposition transcript to throw in and say, so why did you say X, Y, Z when you could, couldn't do X, Y, Z when the film demonstrates that you could certainly, you certainly were capable of X, Y, Z. 
in this particular case, deposition was, or this additional case, the deposition was completed four years prior. Okay, by definition, you know that this is not going to turn out well for the defendant. Um, questions were left for the applicant to, quote, fill in the blanks, end quote, regarding contribution, and the employer did not, didn't do a darn thing for those four years. Um, didn't try to set the deposition thereafter, didn't, um, at the first deposition, have it stipulated the deposition would be continued, um, didn't file a petition to compel within 90 days or 60 days of the deposition, which is required per the CCP. They simply sat on their rights and did absolutely nothing. Then they noticed the second deposition. Good luck with that. Applicants counsel filed a motion, motion to quash, and of course it was granted. In fact, not only was it found that there was no good cause, sanctions, substantial sanctions were, um, were provided. So this is something we should know. The CCP provides monetary sanctions against a party who unsuccessfully opposes a motion for a protective order. So we want to be really careful here. How much did this one cost? And, and the point is they have alternatives. They could have subpoenaed records. They could have subpoenaed medical reports. They could have subpoenaed employment records. Um, they did have alternatives here. The, the, this was a very expensive lesson. How much did it cost? Attorneys fees and costs of over fifteen thousand dollars plus twenty five hundred dollars in sanctions are up to twenty five hundred so nearly twenty thousand um, dollars. All the more reason we want to remember this one and be real careful when we're responding to a motion for a protective order. Um, in this, we have yet another case. After the deposition, the employer wanted information regarding the applicant's current medical condition. Quote unquote. This is one that I've used many times, um, and many times, actually every time I've been successful on it, um, a good cause has been found, um, but we're limited to that issue. Now, hopefully the applicant will be, a, or applicant's counsel will be asleep at the wheel and let you, and give you uh, a little leeway and get, and get a little more information above and beyond um, the uh, current medical condition, but um, it, it's going to depend, it's going to depend on how, um, where applicants counsel is. What if you've already taken the AME or the QME deposition? Do you want another bite at the doctor? Um, another opportunity to uh, take their deposition? Well, if the doctor's changed his or her mind, you're absolutely entitled to do so. Or there's been a material change to the case, you're absolutely entitled to do so. Feel free, you've definitely got good cause. But you do definitely need good cause, just like you need it um, in, the, in the case of uh, the deposition of the applicant or a precipient witness, we now know what that term means, um, if the prior deposition was uh, not stipulated for continuance. So in this case, we have an employee and employer who noticed the deposition within six weeks apart. The first deposition took place and the employer reserved the right, end quote, quote unquote, to, the second dep to a second deposition. The question was, was this good cause? Well, let's take a look at the verbiage, reserve, the right. Is this a stipulation? No, it's not. They said that they didn't stipulate to a continuation and both parties had the opportunity and appeared to have completed their question in the first deposition. So, no, that's not good cause. You don't get to continue it. Oh, remember the verbiage. Words matter. Stipulated, stipulated, stipulated. This was interesting. There was no deposition because the employee was unable to find the AME after the first deposition, so they couldn't schedule the second deposition. The question was, well, is that report admissible, or has applicant lost? Is, is applicant from? Uh, has their due process been violated if they can't take the doctor's uh, deposition part two? And the answer was, no, the report's still admissible. Why? There was no proof that the second deposition would be of value. Now that one I find kind of funky. It turns things a little backwards. Exactly, that's why we're taking the doctor's deposition to find out whether the testimony will be of value. But nevertheless, since this is this ruling was for the defense, we're not going to make that argument. Um, the deposition was concluded, not adjourned. Uh, once again, it's the verbiage. Doctor finds no AOE COE. Depot proceeds. Post depot. Applicant claims unable to complete the deposition because the doctor is retired. What happens? Is there depos is the deposition um, second deposition allowed? If it well, if it's not allowed, is there good cause to do something else? Held no, because the deposition took longer, 4.2 hours over several days, because applicant's counsel was kind of a jerk. 
his actions, inactions, et cetera, um, made this unnecessarily long. And parties will be um, punished for being unreasonable, and this is a perfect example of that. Where do we stick, stick the doctor's deposit or any deposition transcript? What do we um, what do we do with it once we've got it? Well, according to the CCP, it can be admitted at trial or any other hearing, and that's that's the fact. Part of the deposition or the whole thing can be used against a party who was present or represented at the deposition. Um, and most typically, the doctor, the judge doesn't want the entire deposition transcript. He or she will ask that the parties identify the relevant sections because they don't want to plow through 200 pages of, of deposition transcripts, certainly understandably. Uh, the CCP also provides, as I said, that they can be provided for any purpose, uh, including contradicting the deponent as a witness, impeaching the testimony of the deponent as a witness, or for any other purpose permitted by the evidence code, none of which immediately come to, come to mind. Well, we have come up, we are up against the hour. Um, next uh, next uh, um, time we get together in a few months, we're going to uh, figure out how much a call California Applicants Attorneys Association member is really worth. If you don't find that particularly attractive, I promise you it'll be a smaller number than our, call, our friends at call thing. Hopefully you'll, you'll join us. So hang on a second. I'll put you on with Tammy. And you all have a wonderful, wonderful day and a great weekend. Try to stay cool. Bye-bye.